Good afternoon. It is one o'clock Central Standard Time, April the 20th, 2021. We want to say a very special welcome to Amanda Arnold, Manhattan Ogden ISD, Browner from Granbury ISD, and Elm Creek from Southwest ISD. Uh, welcome to the Dallas Schools Environmental Education Center for our virtual field trips. If teachers, if you have not signed up, go to www.tiny.cc slash EEC register and sign up, please. This is just for our attendance records only. Um, the program today will be food webs. During this virtual field trip, students will describe the flow of energy through food webs, beginning with the sun, and predict how changes in the ecosystem affect the, the food web. Mr. Monroe will tell you all about living and non-living things. I guess that's dead or alive. Mrs. Nash will do a food web part one. Ms. Ramirez will do a food web part two. And Ms. Fuller will tell you all about changes in the ecosystem. During this field trip, you cannot ask verbal questions, but you can go to www.tiny.ce slash EEC space question space answer and send in your question. I'll do my best to answer them during the program. If not, I'll send the answers to your teachers. And now I'm going to stop sharing my screen. And Mr. Monroe is going to tell you about living and non-living things. Good afternoon, students. My name is Mr. Monroe, and I'm going to be uh, talking about non-living and living things. You know, uh, there have been many a day that I've been out in my backyard working in. Maybe you've even experienced this. You notice something around you. And I've noticed things that maybe have gotten thrown over in my yard or just suddenly appeared. And I've looked at the object from a, a distance and I've tried to decide, or I've tried to determine whether the object that I'm observing is alive or not alive. And there are two things that I basically look for. First of all, I'll look to see if that object is moving. And that will help me decide whether it's living or not. And then I'll also look and see if it's maybe changing in its appearance, maybe expanding or growing. And that is something else that I'll also use to make that observation. But it's more than that, students, that will determine whether something is alive or not alive. Now, I'm going to be talking about some non-living elements that are very essential to life on our planet. And it, it, they also have characteristics that it will let you know that they're not alive. For example, this rock. You can look at this rock and you know that it's not alive. It's not a living organism, right? Now there is a name, a, a, a scientific word that we give things that are non-living we say that they are abiotic, okay? Even the sand that is in this cup, you know that it's not alive, right? We all know that it's not alive. And it is actually bits and pieces of other rock that has made this type of soil, a sandy type of soil. Now, the elements that I'm talking about that are non-living, that are essential to life is what is, what is the gas that we breathe out? Carbon dioxide. Even though we're breathing it out, is it alive? No. What is the gas that we take in when we inhale? That all living things on our planet need oxygen. Is oxygen alive? No. So it is abiotic. How about this substance that I'm pouring into this beaker? Water, right? You know, if someone was to ask you today, what is water? What would you tell them? You'd probably say, oh, we drink it or, or uh, we water our plants with it. But basically that would be a use, right? If anybody ever asks you what water is, just simply tell them it's H2O. Hydrogen and oxygen mixed together in the right proportion, meaning two atoms of hydrogen plus one atom of oxygen makes the molecule that we call water. It's essential to life. And that's why our planet is abundant with living things because most of our planet 
is covered by water. And then there's another non-living element that is very important to life, and that is the sun. The sun is the ultimate energy source and heat source for our planet, okay? Without the sun, water, and carbon dioxide, this living organism that I'm standing here by would not exist. And it's very important that this type of living organism be abundant on our planet. Now, you might say that a fire that is getting bigger might be considered to be living, right? Simply because it's growing, not the case. Just because it's growing doesn't mean that it is going to be a living element. To become a living element or to even be considered to be living, first of all, living things are made up of the basic unit of life and we call that unit cells. The same type of cells make the same type of tissue. The same type of tissue makes the same type of organ. The same type of organ or the organ that is per uh, performing the same type of life process would make up an organ system and therefore we would have an organism. Now students listen, we have what we call unicellular organisms and then we have what we call multicellular organisms and they all have characteristics that will help you determine whether they're living or not. First of all, I want to talk about the uh, metabolic action that living things have. For something to be alive, it must consume food and be able to convert that food into energy. All living entities employ interior chemical reactions to convert eaten food into energy through a form that we call digest, okay? The other thing is living things have the ability to go through what we call internal environment changes. Organisms that are alive make changes to their internal environment called homeostasis. This represents the action that the body takes to protect itself. For example, you get cold, you start shivering. Well, that response, guess what? That is helping you to generate heat. Take a dog for example. The dog gets overheated, it begins to pant. That is what we call homeostasis. It's an internal environmental change that's helping that animal survive or that living thing survive. Living things also grow. The cells within a living thing have the ability to grow. Now that doesn't mean necessarily it's gonna get bigger, fatter, wider, taller. Uh, Living things, some living things go through what we call life cycle changes. I've got one here I want to show you. That actually went through a growing process. Of course, it did get bigger. This is an American bullfrog. He is alive, he's living, and he didn't look like this always, did he? He's hatched from an egg, he grew from that egg into a tadpole, he swam around, and as he went through metamorphosis, his life cycle changes. You know, he swam around in water for a while with a tail, and then eventually he grew legs, he's, he's growing, and then the tail dropped off and eventually became a full-fledged American bullfrog, okay? So that's a process of growing, and he didn't really grow to get bigger. Now, living things also go through reproduction, okay? They grow and reproduce to make more living organisms like themselves. And uh, they, most of them that are here in nature that we have around here, the way that they reproduce, they lay eggs. Our chickens lay eggs. And I've got another little animal here that if you were here with us, we'd be out on the Post Oak Preserve walking the nature trails today. And I would be looking for a little animal that looks like this. This is a three-toed box turtle. This is a three, uh, she's a female. Her name is Teresa. And I use her in lessons to talk about animal adaptations. Now, Teresa will lay eggs, okay? She will lay eggs and that's the way that little baby box turtles are born, okay? 
So the art of reproducing. The ability to adapt. Plants, animals, people even. Even microorganisms, those are living things, organisms that you have to use a microscope to look at, can live, can adapt to the world around it. Adaptability involves the traits that help living things survive in its environment. One such trait includes the way different animals coach might change through the seasons to make it hard for the prey or predator to be seen, okay? Then the ability to interact. You know, living things interact with each other. For example, flowers interact with bees by releasing pollen for it to be picked up and dispersed among the female plants during their reproduction. And then there is the process of respiration. This is something else that living things do. Respiration is more than just breathing. It's representing the ability of a living organism to convert energy to feed the cells that it is made up of using oxygen to break down sugar to produce carbon dioxide as a byproduct, byproduct expelled during the process of respiration. And then living things move. You might say a plant doesn't move, but if you put a plant close to a window, that plant needs sunlight, guess what that plant's going to do? You may not see it move, but eventually it's going to do a mean lean toward that sunlight. That's called phototropism. Now, students, I've run out of time. So if any of you have any questions, I'm going to turn it back over to Dr. Gorman, and maybe he can answer those questions for you. I want you guys to have a good day. Thank you very much, Mr. Monroe. Uh, what are the differences between living and non-living things? The term living thing refers to things that are now or once were alive. A non-living thing is anything that was never alive. In order for something to be classified as living, it must grow and develop, use energy, reproduce, be made of cells, respond to its environment, and adapt. Thank you, Mr. Monroe. Now, Ms. Nash is going to tell you about food webs with our pellets. Hello, welcome to my classroom. Today we're going to be dissecting or taking apart an owl pellet. And in doing so, we're going to be discovering things about the food chain or the food web. So we know that food chain starts with plants. Okay, they're the producers. They make their own food energy, sun, air, and water, and they grow. And then along come other animals, some animals to eat them. In this case, we're we'll imagining a little mouse or a little rat came along and ate the leaf or the seeds of this plant. And then that little mouse or rat became food for a predator. In this case, we're we'll thinking about the owl. Now this is a beautiful barn owl. Um, he died, she died and left her body to science. And she's a taxidermic specimen. She's quite beautiful and also quite ancient. So beautiful animal, look at those feathers, just beautiful. But she's got big eyes for, because they're nocturnal, they hunt at night, and sharp ears, they can hear really well. These rings of feathers around the eye help funnel the sounds of the ears. They have big talons for killing their prey, and they have quiet feathers. So the feathers of the owl, like this one, are soft along the edges. This is a, a crow, and it's not soft, as you can see, but this makes the owl fly quietly through the night, hunting, hunting. And when they catch a mouse or a rat, they swallow it whole. They can't tear things up because they don't have hands or paws. So they swallow it whole, and the indigestible bits, the fur and the, and the bones and the teeth, are not digested, so it goes in the owl's stomach and it, the meat and the other things are digested and the bones and the fur form a pellet, what we call a pellet, and the owl coughs it up, they cough it up. And it looks like this. If your teacher orders some from a 
Carolina or some other company, they come like this. They've been sterilized. That means they've been heated really hot. So all the germs and bacteria are gone. Okay. So we unwrap them and they look like this. And then with our fingers, we begin tearing it apart. And I've been sifting through this one, okay. And I have found lots and lots of different bones, okay. And the big bones are the easiest ones to get out. So what we're searching for, things like this little skull. See those teeth, those yellow teeth? That's a rodent, okay. You know, because the teeth. And the amazing thing about these teeth, this is the lower jaw here. You can take it and pull that tooth out because their teeth grow. Okay, so they can gnaw on things your whole life long and never run out of teeth. So lots of interesting things to look to discover when you're examining these bones. So here's a little hip bone, okay? And this leg bone goes in that tiny little socket right there, a ball and socket joint. We have a joint just like that in our hip. Okay. So really interesting things you can discover. And your fingers are a really good way to, to discover things. Oh. I dropped some fur on my computer. <laughs> okay, so mostly we find rodents. That means rats and mice. They're the most common prey. And we sort our bones out on a chart. Now there's some other possibilities of things that owls eat. 99% of what we find are the rodents. We also occasionally find what we call a shrew, a tiny little insectivore, a mole, okay, another insectivore, and very occasionally a bird. And I'll show you a couple of the amazing things about the shrew. So a shrew is an insectivore. That means they eat insects. And here's the skull. You can see it. it that's the skull. It's an animal like that big. And they have sharp little teeth, different than the rodent teeth. And we very occasionally find the jaw, the bottom jaw, or the top. Okay. That's all we've ever found. And I found in this, this one I've been looking through, I found one bottom jaw, and I've been looking and looking for the other one, but I haven't been able to find it. So they're so tiny that their little bones just kind of crumble away. We very rarely have found moles, okay, a mole. Now a mole has really unique like shoulder and the big claws for digging, for digging through the earth, right? Really amazing, again, an insectivore. So in the case of the, the shrew, so there was a plant, it got eaten by an insect, the shrew ate the insect, then the owl ate the shrew. So the plant is the producer, the insect is the primary consumer, the shrew is the secondary consumer, and the owl is the tertiary consumer. So those are all what we call different trophic levels, okay? Now, we even more rarely, have found birds. So bird bones are very fragile because they're hollow to make them lighter so they can fly. So this is a skull we found one time. Okay. And there are a couple of reasons that birds don't get eaten very often by owls. A big reason is that most birds are what we call diurnal. That means they're active in the daytime. And of course, owls are nocturnal, active at night. So the birds are hiding away, sleeping when the owls are out hunting. Sadly, the big owls do eat the little owls. So, sad, sad but true. Here's a really weird owl pellet. One of the weirdest ones we ever found. Look how different the color of the fur is, the texture is different than this rat fur. Okay. And the other weird thing about this one is it's got lots of little sharp, sharp teeth in it. So I think it was a little possum, okay? And it also has lots of the legs of, of insects, maybe beetles, probably June bugs, okay? So either the po little possum had eaten a bunch of beetles and then the little possum got eaten by a big owl, maybe a great horned owl could eat a, a small possum. 
And so now we have in this owl pellet, we have both possum bones and insect parts. So again, we can see that food chain going up the to discover what the owls are eating. And that tells us important information about the prey animals that are out there, the health of the ecosystem. Right? So we can actually use these to, to study what's going on in the ecosystem. And you can do your own listening for owls and looking for owls. You might even find an owl pellet very rarely if we ever found them, but you can find them sometimes or maybe your teacher can get one for a lab sometimes. A very fun thing to do. And you can go outside at night and you can listen. And if you hear an owl go, hoo, 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 that's the barred owl. That's our most common owl around, in, at least in Dallas where I live. I hear them all the time. And then the little screech owl that makes a really friendly noise that goes, hoo, 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 and you can go out and listen for them. So enjoy learning more about owls. Okay. And hopefully someday you can investigate an owl pellet. And here's another interesting thing I forgot to show you, the owl skull, not a real one, but a pretend one. Look at the giant eyes. So the reason they have to turn their heads is their eyes got so big that there's no room for muscles to move them anymore. So they have to turn their heads. They can't spin their head around in that beak, okay for tearing, for killing. So thank you. If you have any questions, you can ask Dr. Foreman. Thank you, Ms. Nash. What a beautiful bird that born owl is. And okay, the question, there was a couple of questions. Uh, is an owl pellet poop? Contrary to what kids might think, pellets are puke, not poop. Owls generally swallow their prey whole but are unable to digest certain parts such as bones, teeth, and fur. Uh, Ms. Nash told you, but the scientists can look at the pellet and tell what uh, the diet has been, and also can tell what location the animal lives and where it's been. Now, another question is, where can we get our pellets? If your school is DISD, Dallas Independent School District, you can order them a class set through the Science Resource Center. If you're outside our district, you can go to Carolina Biological and buy the owl pellets from them. Thank you again, Ms. Nash. And now Ms. Ramirez is going to talk about her food chain. Hello, my name is Ms. Ramirez. And in this segment, uh, we're going to be learning about other examples of uh, food webs. So a food web is just a collection of interconnecting food chains. And again, we know that food webs and food chains are showing us how energy is transferred from one organism to another. So essentially who is eating who. So before we start our presentation, I have an animal friend I want you guys to meet. Uh, you probably met this animal friend before. Uh, she is covered in feathers. She has a blue patch of skin covering her ears. She is super soft like silk. She is an omnivore. Um, and she can be both a predator and a prey. So think about what this animal is and I'll go pull her out. So here she is, this is Pepper. She is the blue silky chicken and they get that name because they have a blue patch of skin uh, covering their ears. And if you guys were to touch her, she would feel super soft like silk. Now think about what is Pepper's role in a food web? So what do you think Pepper's going to be eating? And what do you think might eat her? Uh, so think about what is her role in that food web? So I'm going to go ahead and share my screen with you guys and we'll start our presentation. I have two essential questions for y'all. So hopefully by the end of this presentation, you'll be able to answer these two questions. The first question is, from what energy source does all other uh, energy originate from? And the second question is, what is the role of decomposers in a food web? So keep those two questions in mind as we go through the presentation. And then to your left, you'll see a picture or an example of a food web that incorporates a chicken. So make some observations. Think about what do you notice? Notice the direction of the arrows. See if you can explain what those arrows mean. And also think about who eats who or who's getting energy from what. 
and then see if you can identify which ones are the producers, consumers, predators, and prey. Uh, so see if you can identify any of that uh, before I tell you all the answers. And again, feel free to pause the video if you'd like time for discussion time. But I'm going to go ahead and jump right into it. So here's that food web again. Uh, notice the direction of the arrows. That is super important. So the arrow is showing the flow of energy or who is receiving that energy. And we also notice at the top of our food web, we have the sun. Now the sun is non-living or abiotic. But even though it's abiotic or non-living, it is still super important. Uh, so it's important to note that all energy in any food web or food chain will originate from the sun. So the sun provides the initial source of all energy. And without the sun, life on earth would not be possible. Uh, so again, the sun is super important. Now we know that the sun provides energy to our producers. And we learned earlier that producers are just plants. Um, and we know that producers use the sun's energy uh, to create their own food through a process called photosynthesis. Uh, so for me, it's super easy to remember all of those relations because plants, producers, and photosynthesis all start with the same letter P. So again, plants are producers and they simply produce or make their own food through photosynthesis. Now, if we take a look at our food web again, uh, we see these arrows. So we know that the uh, grass is providing energy or giving energy to the grasshopper. The grasshopper is a type of animal and we call animals consumers. So that just means that uh, consumers will consume or eat other things for energy. Uh, we are consumers as well. We have to eat other things for energy too. So within our food web, all of these um, other organisms, these animals are all gonna be consumers. We can further break down consumers into herbivores, omnivores, and carnivores. So our grasshopper here, since it's solely a plant eater, it is an herbivore. And it's gonna be an example of what we call a primary or first level consumer, meaning that it's gonna be the first animal that eats a producer. Now take a look at our food web and see if you can tell what's gonna be receiving energy from the grasshopper. So hopefully you guys were able to notice that the chicken is going to be receiving energy from the grasshopper. Um, so the chicken is what we call a secondary consumer because it's the second organism that's gonna be eating the producer. Um, so here we have our secondary consumer and then notice the chicken can get eaten by the person or it can eaten by the fox. Um, so both the person and the fox are what we call tertiary or third level consumers. And they just happen to be both omnivores. So we know that omnivores are organisms like our chicken that eat both plants and meat material. So my question for you guys is, what could be an example of a quaternary or fourth level consumer for this food web? So if I wanted to add another level to this food web, what could you guys add? And then uh, again, notice people are part of food webs too. We have to eat other things for food and energy. Uh, however, though, uh, everyone always asks me this, we typically do not eat the blue silky chicken here in the US. Uh, they're a little bit different in their breed. Uh, this breed in particular has what's called melanism. And that essentially is a genetic defect in which their bones and their skin um, all, uh, just happen to be black. So in the US, we don't eat this breed of chicken. I think it's just because the color is a little weird. Uh, but in Asia, it's considered a delicacy. So you can see what the blue chicken, uh, blue silky chicken uh, looks like uh, compared to a typical chicken that we would eat here in the US. If you ask me, I think it would taste the same. I think it's just the color that's a little different. Uh, so our next thing is uh, the, what we were missing in our last food web example were the decomposers. So think about what is the role of decomposers in a food web? And um, hopefully you guys are able to identify some of the decomposers in this food web and also, also identify what they're eating. Uh, so the decomposers would be in this uh, level here. So we have examples of decomposers would be fungi, bacteria, and then some invertebrates. So think of your worms and some bugs. And hopefully you guys notice that these decomposers are eating the dead stuff. So when the producers die and when the consumers die, decomposers will come in and break that dead stuff down. 
So we consider them recyclers. They break down the dead plant and animal material and they're returning nutrients back into the soil so that the producers can grow. And the acronym that I use to help remember examples of decomposers is FBI. So that's fungi, bacteria, and some invertebrates. Uh, those are all good decomposers. So in this little video here, uh, think about what is the role of decomposers in a vermicompost. So a vermicompost is just a box that I have filled with worms. And coincidentally, other decomposers came on in there. So there are some mites and molds that are breaking down a donut. Um, so lots of decomposers that are helping to break down my leftover food and waste. Um, so think about, can there be other things besides decomposers inside my vermicompost box? Do you think you can find consumers um, or even producers inside a vermicompost? And here you can see all those cool little insects called columbola. They are also decomposers that are helping uh, those worms break down my food scraps. And then in my last little slide, um, I have a challenge for you guys. Research the ecosystem in which a ball python snake lives. And then see if you can draw and label a food web that includes a ball python snake and at least five other organisms. Now I'm gonna get ready to show you guys a predator prey relationship involving a ball python snake. Um, my snake is going to end up eating and killing the mouse. Uh, so if you don't wanna watch the video, just put your head down. I uh, just wanted to give you a heads up before I play it. Uh, but this is a totally normal relationship. Uh, snakes are carnivores. They have to eat other organisms for food, unfortunately. So it's just a part of life. Um, so this snake is Basil. She is my snake at home and uh, she eats mice or other rodents and that is how she gets her energy. Now this whole process of her um, eating and digesting it took over 10 minutes. So I fast forwarded it super fast for you guys to see in the time allotted. Uh, but Basil has really strong teeth that are recurved so that she can grab the mouth. Um, and then she uses her super strong muscles uh, to constrict or squeeze the mouth so that it can't breathe. And then she will eat it whole. Uh, so it is pretty fascinating to watch how they hunt and um, devour their food. It's rather interesting. So again, uh, basil would be the predator and the mouse would be the prey. And again, it's all part of normal life. She has to eat just like everything else. So I'm gonna stop my screen share and I do have a snake to show you guys. This one's not basil. This one is a bigger one uh, that we have here at school. Her name is Pelota and Pelota is also a ball of python. Uh, she is much bigger than mine. Uh, but she is a carnivore, so she eats other things uh, for food, particularly other animals for food. Um, and also think about, remember that challenge question, research where these uh, snakes are from and what are some other things that they might eat where they're from. So think about the role in a food web. Uh, so that's all I have for you guys. We're going to pass it back to Dr. Gorman to answer any questions. Thank you, Ms. Ramirez, and your menagerie there. Uh, one question is, what do you call a group of connected food chains? And Ms. Ramirez covered that very well. You call it a food web. Thank you for your question. Thank you, Ms. Ramirez. And now we're going to let Ms. Fuller tell us about changes in the ecosystems. Good afternoon, boys and girls. Well, I'm going to continue with the Python trend here. This is a baby uh, ball python, uh, very similar to Pelota, the great big one that Miss um, Ramirez was showing you. If you, these animals are from Africa. If you buy one, it's and have it at your house. If you get tired of it, you need to get rid of it by giving it to someone else or selling it to someone else or taking it to a rescue. Do not let it go in the environment because what will happen is the ecosystem will be ruined. And that's what's happened in the Everglades. People in Florida released a pet that's not from the United States. It's called a Burmese python. They're huge. They get to be about 20 feet long and they can eat deer and they're ruining the ecosystem in the Everglades. 
So that's one of the things we're going to touch on when we talk about changes in the food web, in food uh, chains, in ecosystems. So I'm, this is spring, by the way. I'm going to put spring back in a box right here. And uh, let me share my screen with you. We're going to look at some of these issues as we go through all of this. So changes in ecosystems, how ecosystems experience change. There's a lot of different ways. So let's think of a couple of essential questions. What is a change in an ecosystem that can increase populations? And what is a change in an ecosystem that can decrease predator populations? Well, let's talk first about those rabbit populations. Look at the picture on the left. This is another example of how someone released into the wild in a diff on a different continent, an animal that had no natural predators. Uh, when people uh, started settling Australia from England and from Europe, they brought European rabbits with them. And there wasn't really a lot of uh, a pressure from predators on them. And they essentially took over Australia and uh, they ate everything, they ate all the grass, then they ate the shrubs, then they started ringing the trees. And as a result, there was a, a, a loss of it, the environment because the soil started eroding away because there, was, there were no uh, plants to hold it in place. So it was very devastating to Australia and they've tried various things over the past 150 years to try to control the rabbit population. At one point they were killing about 2 million rabbits a year and it wasn't having an impact uh, on it because there were so many rabbits and they were able to reproduce so fast. Now, as far as predators are concerned, if you decrease the amount of prey, the, the number of predators will decrease, but there've also been uh, laws that have been changed that have allowed people to hunt predators to the point where there's not a lot of pressure on the uh, prey populations and the prey populations are getting out of control. Uh, and of course, uh, by being hunted, the uh, predator populations are also being decreased. Flooding can change an ecosystem. Uh, it can bring in new uh, uh, materials, silt and uh, minerals, nutrients to the soil. That's good. It can recharge the groundwater. That's good. It can replenish the surface water. That's good. But it can also disrupt the food chain. Uh, let's take a coyote, for example. He will normally eat uh, small mammals, things like uh, rats and mice and squirrels and rabbits. And if he can't find any of those because of the floods, he may have to move way down the food chain uh, to, to eat things like frogs and crayfish, something that is available to him. So flooding can disrupt the, uh, the food chain in an ecosystem. Drought can be a terrible um, uh, impact uh, on an ecosystem. Uh, what drought is, is when you don't get enough rain and there's not, not uh, the soil is not moist enough. And that's really how they measure that is the amount of moisture that's in the soil. You can see in the picture on the right that was taken during the, the Dust Bowl. And it was a terrible time in American history and a, a lot of the middle part of the United States essentially just blew away because there was not enough rain and poor farming practices. Now, exotic species introduced uh, can disrupt a, an ecosystem. We're having a big problem in Texas with zebra mussels being uh, introduced into the, um, into the lakes and ponds. In the middle are fire ants. We have a lot of those in Texas. They both bite and sting and they can decrease the uh, populations of mammals. 
that are in the wild because they will bite and sting on the babies like the baby rabbits or the baby fawns that, that are staying in one place and uh, so they can be killed by fire ants. So that's a, that's a hazard. And then we have feral hogs, which are very similar in the effect on the uh, ecosystem uh, to the Burmese python. They're very destructive and uh, they tear up they tear up cropland, pasture land, forest floors, and landscaping, and they'll eat anything they can catch. So, and they're very like the rabbits; they're very prolific. They they have lots and lots of babies, and they can start having babies when they're very young. So, uh, it, it's very difficult to control the the feral hog population. Now. Um, I, I saw that uh, Kansas has joined us, Manhattan has joined us, and we've got a similar problem um, with habitat change, ecosystem change here on our ecoregion. Our ecoregion is called the Blackland Prairie, and it goes from where we are all the way down to San Antonio. Well, uh, what you have in Kansas, you've got three kinds of prairies. On the Colorado side of your state, you have a short grass prairie. On the uh, far eastern side of your state, you have a tall grass prairie. And in the middle, you have mixed grass prairies. Well, ours is essentially a mixed grass prairie. But like your state, most of our uh, natural prairie land has been destroyed by either agriculture or by urbanization. So these animals and plants have lost, have had a loss of habitat. Now, most of the prairie grass is actually underground. About 75 to 80% of the prairie grass is underground. So fire doesn't really bother it. It'll just come right back up. But if you plow it up and get rid of it, then that's gonna be a problem. And just like in te Texas in the Blackland Prairie, your tall grass prairie has essentially uh, disappeared except about 1% of it. And this makes it one of the rarest and most danger, endangered ecosystem in the world. The, uh, the prairies began uh, about eight to 10,000 years ago after the end of the last ice age. And it, uh, it developed in a very complicated biodiverse ecosystem and only the rainforest in the Amazon really is more biodiverse than, than the, the prairie. So it's a very important ecosystem. We've had global climate change, which has changed migration patterns and animals, changed the blooming times of plants, and has, of course, impacted a lot of endangered animals. And then, of course, we have disease and insect infestation. Over on the left uh, is a picture at Rocky Mountain National Park. They've got 17 species of bark beetles. And uh, it's really destroying the, um, the, the trees there. It's really sad to go and see all these dead trees. But part of the problem is it doesn't get real, real cold there like it used to. The temperatures are rising. And so it's not killing the beetle larvae. A, a little cacti moth, the cactus moth, and it's destroying our uh, very popular cactus we have here. It's a prickly pear cactus. Uh, we call it a nopalis, and uh, people like to eat it, but it's, uh, it's endangered from this little cactus moth. So I'm going to uh, stop our uh, presentation here. And let me... Uh, stop sharing my screen. If you have any questions about how uh, ecosystems can be changed either naturally or uh, floods, fires, animals, or unnaturally by introduced species and uh, human uh, urbanization, Dr. Gorman will be more than happy to answer those questions for you. Thank you, good day. Thank you, Mrs. Fuller. Uh, changes in the ecosystems, wind, rain, predation, and earthquakes are all examples of natural processes which impact an ecosystem. Humans also affect ecosystems by reducing habitat, overhunting, broadcasting pesticides or fertilizers, and other influences. 
The line between natural and human caused effects often blurs. Thank you again, Mr. Maris. And now I am going to share my screen. During this virtual field trip, students describe the flow of energy through food webs, beginning with the sun, predicting how changes in the ecosystem affected the food web. Mr. Monroe discussed living and non-living things. Ms. Nash covered food webs with owl pellets. Ms. Ramirez did food webs part two. And Ms. Fuller did changes in ecosystems. How did we do? Thank you for watching. Teachers, if you would, go to www.tiny.cc slash EEC feedback. Fill out a very short form and send it back to us. We would appreciate it. We hope that you have a great rest of the day, but more importantly, I hope you have a great rest of your life.